Good morning, my dear students. You are welcome to a good Sunday against a good Monday. This morning discussion will center on learning, learning through play. We have done enormously in terms of our course EDCR 241, EDCR 241, Psychology of Human Development and Learning. And per our course structure, ideally, we should have taken you 30% face-to-face, 70% online. But we change the narrative just to help students to understand and appreciate the course we are teaching. Going forward, we are turning the table where we do much online and less face-to-face. -face. Much online and less face-to-face. -face. We are left with three units to go. Level three, you need to go. Learning through play, which ends with memory. We have transfer of knowledge or transfer of information. And the last one, motivation. So we are likely to do learning through play, that play-based learning, memory, transfer of learning online. Then we come one, one week to finish the motivation then we end our semester. As you prepare for your end of semester and our personalized quiz that will mount on the LMS for you to write. So this morning, I'm going to take you through the learning by play or learning through play. We call it play-based learning, play-based learning. Many researchers have come to give their views in terms of play-based learning. And none of them have been able to give a concretized or an accepted definition when it comes to the word play. The likes of Eric Erickson, Jerome Bruner, and Lev Vygotsky have offered their views, yet we don't have a definite definition when it comes to the term play. However, playing can be seen as the main opportunity where children can take risk without fear of failure. In a play, Learner must do which ever thing that he or she has chosen to do without being forced or compelled by the teacher or by his own interest or by a strong passion. It means using play or the word play, you allow learners to choose what they want to do. You don't restrict them. You allow them to do it as and when they think they're supposed to do it. So using play, the child feels entertained and free of any fear and have hope that things can occur. <clears throat> and again, using play, it is very important that during childhood, we try to use it, ask it to help the young learners to develop. They're able to develop in terms of their cognitive aspects, their emotional aspects, their social aspects, and as well, their intellectual aspects. So teachers as we are, our aspiring teachers, it is important that we understand the developmental theories that have explained play and how it is used in the context of teaching and learning. And again, it is important that we understand that play has an important role in developing the child socially, emotionally, physically, and as well cognitively. Therefore, it is important you teachers who are teaching the young learners, if you have good academic background, good training that we are giving, for you to be able to evaluate the problems and offer appropriate support to children who may have difficulty in joining play-based learning, especially those with disabilities. So play is an important element in the life of a child. It helps the child will be able to achieve mastery in the skills you, the teacher, have asked them to do. Play also promotes learning in various physical means of the child, development of self-confidence, the ability to do things without fear. It also allows learners to be independent. They don't rely on people. It also allows learners to be able to develop language because they, they, they interact, they engage with colleagues. They have a lot of things that they take from them. And as well, it helps learners to be able to develop emotionally. They understand the emotions of others and equally those of theirs. 
and how it influenced themselves and those of their colleagues. So play is an important activity in early childhood education as it contributes holistically in terms of the growth and development of the learner. So when play is added to our learning process, it provides all the elements that we need in order to engage the child's brain development and as well keep the child healthy in the school system. Even though the concept of play seems or looks like very simple, in reality, it's very difficult. You can't just say play is just simple because it demands planning, technical mind by the teacher. It demands resources. That is why I say it's simple by word, but then it's not simple when it comes to action. When we are going to use play-based learning, there are some factors we have to consider before we develop or we allow learners to engage in a play. These factors are categorized into three. We have the teacher factor, the learner factor, and then uh, the, the teacher factor, the learner factor, and as well, the tax at hand. Yeah, the tax at hand. That's the environmental factor. We are going to start discussing them one by one. The first factor is the environmental factor. The environment where you want to engage your learner to do play-based learning should be safe. So if you have an environment that is having impediments, restrictions to the movement of a child, don't expect any play-based learning to occur. There wouldn't be any effective learning that will occur because the learner might not have the opportunity to move around freely. So we advise that when you are designing or developing a play-based learning, the environment you live in, the environment you want to use should be devoid of distractions. As, let's say, for example, you want to teach learners how to write or writing skills. And there's another room close to them that is meant for music. As they are learning how to write, a music is playing behind. There wouldn't be any effective learning, meaning there are distractions over there. There are things that impede their progress of learning how to write. So we advise that your place-based learning environment should be free from obstructions, should be free from things that will hinder the learning process. And when we are designing play-based learning, it's advised that we design in such a way that there should be a place where we have convenience. When we say convenience, if the child feel like we win or defecating, there should be a place. That is why it's not by surprise. If you go to the crutch and the rest, anywhere the children are, we have those things available. And again, they should have a place they can take a nap when they are feeling tired, they can take a, a bit sleep and later come and join their group. If those things are not provided for the younger one in the learning situation, when it comes to the environmental factor, don't expect any play-based learning to occur because they'll be stressed, they wouldn't be concentrating and lack of attention towards you, the teacher who is teaching them. But then an important factor in play-based learning is the space in which the play occurs. You have to give a space that's not too small, which is not too large. You should give a space where learners can run through. It's advised that when you are given the space, if you have in between 30 to 50 square feet or square meter for each child, so that the child can move around and come back and extend his, his or her repertoire of play. If you give a small space, it will favor you, the teacher, but it wouldn't favor the learner. How does it, that favor the teacher? It makes you monitor everything so well but the learner does not learn extensively because he or she is being restricted to a small place where only few people can be engaged. But in play-based learning, you are building the learner holistically and extensively. When the space is big and there are many people there, he can extend his learning from one angle to the other and move without any other obstructions. What do we do when we want to prepare the play-based learning environment? We have this at hand. We need to ask those questions. Our ability to, un to understand those questions will lead us to develop and plan an environment that will meet or suit the play-based learning environment. First question is, how is the space arranged, both indoors and outdoors? Is the space catchy? Is it attracting? Is it appealing? And as well of it, is it good for the learner? Your ability to understand this will allow you to organize or plan an environment that will lead the learner to learn better. And again, you have to also ask yourself, are there clearly marked areas in which children may find the way play materials are located or where play materials are found? Once you have a play environment, you should have a clear cut 
descriptions to the materials that are needed for a play-based learning to occur. The environment that is devoid of such things means it has no directions, it has no clear cut, uh, what do you call it, indicators to what's supposed to be taken and what's supposed not to be taken. So mind you. And again, you should ask yourself as a teacher, is there a spacious place for you where children can talk among themselves and move around between and among themselves? If those things are yes, then you may have a good play-based learning occurring. If no, you may not have it, be having it. So all of these features of the classroom will foster children's freedom to choose their own activities, which in turn develop them in terms of complexity. And it's again, encourage them in ongoing play works. So as I indicated, you should have a space in between 30 and a 50 square meter and not, nothing less than that. Anything less than that will, will, will impede the learner, will not allow the learner to move around. So in setting up play-based learning environment, we advise that the teachers will consider the following. You should have natural light in the environment. The place should be light. The space should be lightening. The space should be clear. It shouldn't be dark. Natural light reduces energy use. So if you have natural light, allow open windows, ventilation should be given too. The place should be keep quiet and not noisy. You should keep quiet and not noisy. If you have a play-based learning environment to be quiet, it, if it affects positive learning in the children. And again, what do you call it? It influences the effect. I'm talking about the positive effect or the positive effect of positive learning. But if you have a noisy environment, that might not go in line or good with the learner. So what is your role as a teacher when it comes to play-based learning? Your role is to determine the developmental goals and objectives of the learner. What do you want to have or to observe in the learner's life? Two, you should know the principles of the learning that children are using in terms of their learning styles. What learning styles are exhibited by your learners? Three, design and set up the learning activities in the learning center for effective play-based learning to occur. And again, try to evaluate your environment to see whether it meets the standard or not. By evaluating, you are trying to judge the weight of the environment. What is the role of you, the teacher, when it comes to play-based learning? The role of teacher cannot be overemphasized and cannot be berated or reduced to anything. The teacher is a key person that tries to help the learner to get all that he wants to get after the parents have initiated whatever that they needed. So teacher, you are more or less the second parent of the learner. The second parent of the learner. So whatever that you do has a reflection, has a positive reflection or negative reflection in the life of a learner. So we have factors in a teacher being the second factor that you have to consider that can go against or improve upon uh, play-based learning. The first factor is the teacher attitude your likes and dislikes of the learning activity, your passion to the learner, how you let the learner become engaged with you or being close to you will enable or help improve play-based learning. If a teacher develops an interest in a learner, the learner sees the teacher to be someone who wants to be like them, who is doing like the way they are doing, and will always concentrate and do all that the, the teacher wants them to do. But if you think you are the boss, you wouldn't really engage your learners. You think, ah, maybe you have everything. After all, you are to supervise. You see yourself to be different from them. Play based learning will not okay. Two, the teacher has to engage himself, involve himself in activities that will increase and widen or broaden your repertoire of knowledge when it comes to play based learning. A teacher should circulate himself or align himself to a particular way of play based learning without trying to explore other avenues. That will give you rich experience in the area. An experience does not come by accident. You should do it and get the experience in it. So it's demanded that a teacher engage in a lot of play-based learning so that you can be experienced in planning. The third teacher factor is the teacher training. Teacher training is a bi-directional thing. One from the university or the school you were nurtured in and personalized effort in getting the knowledge required for you to use in, uh, in teaching or national learners using play-based learning. If we teach you from the class, is it dependent on you as a teacher or a potential teacher to go out there and find knowledge towards your area so that you can have a host of information 
that you can use as basis to teach your learners when it comes to play-based learning. Don't always and only remain in the class waiting for your lecturers or your teachers or your mentors to pour the information onto your mind. That alone will not fetch you what they want. Remember, your lecturers, your teachers, your mentors are not repertoire of knowledge. They are not totally repository of knowledge. They cannot assume perfectionism in their area. And as well, they cannot be the paragon of all knowledge. They have their setbacks. So if you go out there to also search for information and train yourself personally to complement what the teacher has taught you, it will help you a lot when it comes to play-based learning. My candid plea as my young learners and teachers. On this note, we have the learner factor. When you are going to engage learners in play-based learning, know and understand the kind of learner you are using. Not every learner is supposed to take the same particular or the same or a particular play-based learning technique. Play-based learning technique can allow you to choose and devise the strategies that you want to use based on the learner. So if you consider your learner before doing any other thing that you want to do when it comes to play-based learning, success will be chopped or will be achieved. But if you don't consider them, it will go against you. And what do we want to consider in the child? The learner maturity, the learner intelligence, the learner aptitude, the mindset he or she carries to the class, the, the development of his cognitive abilities and the learner's feelings, emotional affect, the learner's entry behavior, what the learner know and what the learner is about to be exposed to. All this is supposed to be taken into consideration by the teacher so that you can have a well-planned play-based learning activity for the learners. If you don't consider these things as a teacher, then don't expect any good thing to come from your learners. On this note, we end our lecture on play-based learning. The next lecture will follow, which will be the human memory. Thank you.